for um, having me here today. Thank you, Cynthia. It's wonderful to come here and hear about the dreams of the Akbarli Foundation. I, I'm very excited to see how they develop. Uh, I'm here to uh, tell you about a, a, the dreams of the Buck Institute, which is the place that I went to about nine months ago. And our focus is on aging. And you may be thinking, why do you have a speaker here to talk about aging when the interest is in cancer? And so my job today is to tell you that research on aging is really just another way of thinking about treating diseases. And moreover, that aging is important throughout the world, including Africa. So if I could have the first slide. This is the challenge we face in aging research. In 2002, very few countries had a large percentage of elderly citizens. The red on here in these slides show you which countries have over 20% of the population that are over the age of 60. And then on the bottom are the projections from 2050. And what you see is that we're going to become a very elderly globe in 2050. Much of the world is going to have up to 40% of their population over the age of 60. This is a major challenge. Now, I know what you're thinking to yourself as you look at this slide. Look at Africa. Africa doesn't seem to have this challenge. It seems like aging is something that's affecting the rest of the world. But in truth, I'm going to tell you that it's, aging is important all over the world, including Africa. If I can have the next slide. This is a key statistic. This is life expectancy comparing Europe and Africa and also comparing high income and low income. And what you can see is that either in Europe or in high income uh, people around the world, they live about 25 years longer than uh, people from Africa or low income people. So it seems like uh, Africans don't get old, but the key statistic is in the next slide. Um, and that shows health span. So this is a more important measure. This is a measure of how long people are healthy and functional and disease free in life. How long they're able to resist chronic diseases. And what you can see is that um, at 70, uh, Europeans start to lose health span. They start to get diseases that keep them from doing the things they want to do in life. And in Africa, that happens at the age of 46. So even though lifespan is compressed, you can see that there's still a period of chronic disability uh, with age in Africa. And it's this period of chronic disability that we want to do something about. So aging is affecting everyone throughout the world. It just affects people at different times in their lifespan. Um, and the same is true for low income individuals around the world. Uh, so why do we know it's aging? Well, let's look at the next slide. What you can see, this is the top 10 causes of mortality uh, in low income and high income individuals. And there are differences on this slide, but the key thing is the similarities. If you look at the top four causes of mortality, they're very similar. Lower, resp uh, lower res respiratory infection, heart disease, stroke. They affect both high income and low income individuals. They affect individuals in Europe and the United States and in Africa. So the causes of mortality are very much the same. Why is that? Why does aging research matter with respect to these diseases? Well, if you look at the next slide, I think it becomes clear. This is the rate of mortality caused by different diseases um, with age. So as we go across the bottom, people are getting older and you can see the rate of all of these diseases comes up. Now you can't read this slide, but I'll tell you what's on it. So cancer is on it. it that's on the top of the list. Neoplasias, cardiovascular disease is on this. Those are the things we expect with aging. But more surprisingly, tuberculosis is on this. Pneumonia, uh, viral infections, uh, influenza. These are things that affect people around the world. So almost regardless of the cause of chronic disease, it goes up in aged individuals. So the important thing is encompassed on the next slide. This is really the message of the Buck Institute. And that's that we believe aging is one common cause of disease. And that what we should be thinking about are ways to treat the cause, to treat aging, to find ways to slow aging. And if we do that, we think it will provide a broad spectrum of protection across a whole range of diseases, including breast cancer, uh, including cervical cancer, and many other diseases. And so this is the excitement that we have. And it's our hope that we can uh, take this approach and try to understand uh, something about aging and do something about it. Is it possible to do something about aging? Most people think it's inevitable that aging happens. But we already know you can do something about aging. We already know that there are environmental interventions that affect aging. Living conditions affect aging. Diet affects aging. A healthy diet leads to longer lifespan. 
exercise affects aging. If you exercise regularly, you have a longer, healthier life. So there are things that already have an effect. But we also believe that there are going to be pharmaceutical approaches, drugs, stem cell therapies that are going to be beneficial for aging. And the research is very promising in this regard at the Buck Institute and, and really research about around the globe on aging. So why has aging research really expanded? Uh, and that's because we use model organisms to study why aging occurs. And on the next slide are the common model organisms. We, ha we can break them into two groups. We have simple animals like flies and worms, and they have many advantages. They age very rapidly over a matter of two to three weeks, and they're very cheap to work with. So you can do many types of experiments in a rapid manner and understand something about aging. But they're not that related to humans. Uh, we can also do experiments in, mon in uh, rhesus monkeys or mice, and those are much more related to humans, but they're very cost ineffective. It's expensive to do experiments in monkeys. Rhesus monkeys live 35 years, so it's a long experiment. So by combining these two different approaches to study aging, the field has really learned a lot about what causes aging. Now, I could tell you a lot about that research, but I don't have time to do that today. What I'm going to do is just show one slide or two slides which is, I think, one of the key findings in aging research, and it's really embodying the promise that this research has. So on the next slide, what you're seeing here is a drug that extends survival in mice. So what the experimenters at the National Institute of Aging Intervention Testing Program did is that they took a drug, rapamycin, and they gave it to mice at 600 days of age. Now, mice only live about two and a half years, so that's the equivalent of a 65-year-old person. And when they did that, these are females, the mice lived 15% longer. They had 15% longer life and a healthier life. They were resistant to the diseases of cancer, neurodegeneration. And so there, this is an amazing finding, I think. And we don't know if this drug is going to work in humans yet, but it's proof in principle that you can take a mammal, give it a drug, and make it live longer. And I think as we develop more and more of these compounds, some of them are going to be effective in humans. But it's not the survival curve that's the most promising. It's looking at the mice. So on the next slide, that's shown. And unfortunately, my movies aren't going to play here. Uh, but what I can tell you is that we have four mice in this panel. The mice on the bottom are the control mice. They didn't get this drug. And these are the last two surviving mice out of several hundred that were tested. And you can, I hope, see that these mice don't look very healthy. The one on the right has cancer. It has a big tumor on its side. The one on the left, its back legs don't work very well and it can hardly walk around the cage. If you were to be able to see the movie with the top panels, what you'd see is very healthy mice. These are the mice on the drug. They're still running around. They're still healthy. They're still inquisitive. They're still looking for food. And so I don't think it's the survival curve that's the most exciting thing. I think these movies are the most exciting thing. And I don't know about you, but if it were me and I had to be a mouse, I'd want to be the top mice and not the bottom mice. Uh, so that's, the, I think, the most exciting finding. And we're actively looking for other uh, reagents and approaches that are going to generate these same benefits in the hope that one day we can find something to give to humans to give them longer, healthier lives. So the next slide is just my last slide. And I think it's really the goal of the Buck Institute. And I think it's similar to the, some of the goals we've heard today with regard to cancer intervention. The idea is prevention. It's about keeping people healthy. It's about screening and avoiding getting people with cancer. And this is what we want to do in a broader context with respect to aging. We want to find things we can do to people while they're still healthy to keep them healthy longer. And that's very different than much of medical research, which is invo involves waiting until people get very sick, and then it's very hard to cure them of their disease. We think if you can intervene earlier while people are still healthy, it's going to be easier to keep them healthy longer. We're going to extend health span, and that's going to have major benefits uh, both in the developed world and in the developing world. So with that, I'll just stop and uh, thank you again for inviting me. It's been a really uh, pleasurable experience to come here and see what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, Professor.